Good afternoon. Um, I'm Mary Watson, Executive Dean um, of the Schools of Public Engagement at the New School. And I want to thank you all for joining us uh, here this afternoon. Um, as we all know, yesterday's um, unexpected snowstorm, which in, was a vibrant one, including thunder and uh, lightning and wild snow, prohibited our presentation last night. So I appreciate everyone for reaccommodating their schedules for these very uh, important presentations. So um, I want to start by congratulating our two fellows um, and, um, and uh, letting them know that we're excited to hear about your work. We are um, thrilled to welcome you here and we look forward to what you have to say tonight and hope you're having a good time um, at, the, at the new school. Um, I also want to rec recognize that the uh, representative of the Council General of Mexico in New York is here with us today, um, Paulina Strausberg Lona, thank you very much for joining us um, and I welcome you back to the new school. I understand you were here last year at a fellows presentation, so Mexico has had a, a winner in each of the last two years, so you've become a regular on this stage, so we... we We'll see you next year, that's right. Uh, just like at the, uh, at the Oscars we saw, there's a lot of award winning happening um, that you're showing up for, so thank you for joining us. Um, today, we're here to celebrate the President Nestor Kirchner Fellowship Program, which was established in 2011 to honor the legacy of former President Nestor Kirchner and is completing now its seventh annual year of fellowships. This program was made possible by the generous support of the late Julian Studley, a former New School trustee and generous supporter of the Latin American Observatory here and the, Univers the Universidad Nacional de San Martin. Um, from 2011, we've been uh, awarding this fellowship each year. Um, we've received more than 760 applications from all over Latin America. In the seven years, 24 fellowships were awarded and 24 fellows have traveled here to New York. So 24 out of 760, that's not bad. Um, uh, overall, over the seven years, we've had seven fellows from Argentina, six from Brazil, three from Mexico, two from Colombia, two from Peru, one from Bolivia, one from Cuba, one from Ecuador, and one from Uruguay. So it looks like um, if Colombia gets another uh, winner, we can actually catch up with Mexico next year. Um, but um, we've had great representation from all throughout the region. This year, we had 107 applicants from 17 countries in Latin America. And this was the third year that the fellowship program included fellows from all of Latin America and the Caribbean, awarding four fellowships for the year. So the selection process is rigorous um, and complicated and long and relaxing for the applicants. Um, takes place in three steps. Uh, first, there's initial on-site jury um, that meets in Buenos Aires in June 2017 to select the first round of applicants. This, those individuals go forward to the second round, which has an international jury of 30 jurors from 10 countries, including new school faculty um, and uh, our president of the University, David Van Zandt. The final jury met in August 2017 in Buenos Aires to select the winners. So the final jury met at the campus of the University of San Martin and was composed of 12 members. Those 12 members included David Van Zandt, president of the new school, um, who has participated as a juror in seven cycles of the fellowship. Uh, Carlos Ruta, the rector of the Universidad Nacional de San Martin, Mercedes Marco del Pont, former governor of the Central Bank of Argentina. Uh, Martin Abueles, director of the Buenos Aires Office of UN Economic Commission of Latin America. Carlos Acuena, professor of UNSAM and senior researcher. And Pablo Vinicor, the professor at Flasco and former vice minister of social development in Argentina. That's a pretty impressive uh, jury panel, so congratulations. So this year we have four winners. Two have already been received. Um, in November of 2017, we heard from Maria Sofia Bernard from Argentina and Paulo Alas Rossi from Brazil, and they presented their work um, here in November. And tonight, or today I guess is the right way to say it, we have two fellows um, which, whom we're welcoming, Patricia Martinez Corral from Colombia and Cassandra Castanera, sorry, Castorena Sanchez, who is uh, here from Mexico. So let's have a round of applause for our two fellow winners. So now I'm going to turn the microphone over to Margarita Gutman, who's the director of the Latin American Observatory, who will say a little bit about the OLA and then introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Marie. And I think that the, as we have done for the last seven years, 
in 13 prior times. And before uh, launching the and hearing to our fellows, uh, we would like to remind you and uh, to, to our audience that the OLA was formally launched at the new school in September 2006, which is almost 12 years ago. And it was launched by the former president of Argentina, Cristina Fernández de Kirchner, and it is co-directed by Michael Cohen. Uh, I am pleased to present again in this occasion, as in all the other public lectures uh, of our fellows, uh, the three main objectives of the OLA. First, to study, to study the process of change in our region, in Latin America, political, social, urban, and economic changes. Second, to link, to link institutions in the US and in Latin America to understand the challenges of building a more just and democratic society in our globalized world. For this purpose, we have created opportunities for Latin American leaders to directly express their views to the audiences in New York. And overall, the OLA, since 2006, we hosted more than 100 events. We can. They were 100 and something. Uh, we, we hosted here at the New School but also in Argentina, Chile, Ecuador, and Mexico. The third objective of the OLA is to work together with Latin American institutions to further these goals, developing and collaborative projects with local and international organizations. As you might know, perhaps you have heard or you went to our website, the OLA has uh, five main theme. It's organized around three, uh, five main themes. First, the Latin America on the Move program, which brings speakers to New York. Among them, we have uh, Tabaré Vázquez, president of Uruguay. We have also Ollanta Humala as a presidential candidate from Peru. We have Nestor Kirchner several times, and the last in 2010, a month before he died. We have also Rafael Correa, President of Ecuador in 2011, Alicia Bárcena, Secretary General of the UN Economic Commission of Latin America, ECLAC, and Álvaro García Linera, Vice President of Bolivia in 2015. And we also have several ministers and public servants from Latin America, the last of them being the Secretary of Territory, Habitat and Housing of the Metropolitan Municipality of Quito, Ecuador, in late January a month and something before. The other program is the Building Latin American Bicentennial Program, which has held two international calls for papers and audiovisuals. And since 2009, we think that has put the OLA on the map uh, in the region. Uh, we published two books in 2012 and 2016, uh, uh, containing all the results of the two calls. And also, this work triggered a request by the government of Argentina to prepare an official report of the celebration of the Bicentennial in Argentina uh, that we published in a book in 2016. Then we have the Design and Social Development Program, which is an interdisciplinary and collaborative work, which, with, together with the Global Urban Future Project, had a relevant presence in the UN uh, UN Habitat 3 in Quito in October 2016, and in the World Urban Forum 9 in Kuala Lumpur in early February this, this year. In Quito, we prepared, published, and presented two main products, the Habitat Commitment Index and, in, and the book Habitat in Depth, 20 Years of Urban Policies in Latin America, which has been translated into English. I didn't say the title in Spanish. The book is in Spanish but has been translated into English, and we are expecting the response uh, from the publisher, Rutgers, uh, to whom uh, they were very happy to receive it and review it. And in Kuala Lumpur, we organized a pre-event and a side event in the official World Urban Forum, presenting the findings, findings of the current research about the Habitat Commitment Index 2.0, which is at the city level. 
Another line is the Cuba program, now underway, that has now a studio course which is taking place now in the spring, directed by Michael Cohen and Tony Tang, and working for the office of the Historiador of La Habana, and we have some of the students of the studio sitting in this room. Finally, we have the President Nestor Kirchner Fellowship, which we think that it is particularly relevant in this moment in which after uh, almost a decade of a progressive trend in our countries, uh, Latin American region is uh, under a kind of central right trend of government and administration. So, uh, having said this, I, uh, I want only to say something about the fellowship. Um, and I want the process of uh, uh, promoting all of this, disseminating the fellowship, that it was, a, and it is, a, a real a way of a publicizing a, a fellowship that is not only academic, but it is academic also and a, for people who are, for young a, leaders, a, or possibly leaders in Latin America, who are committed to social justice and to social work. A, from this point of view, this is a very, a, a different fellowship. It's not only academic and it's not only related to social commitment. It's the intersection of the academy and social commitment, which we think is what we mostly do in the new school. Uh, the process to make this uh, fellowship known in all Latin America was difficult. We worked a lot doing all kinds of uh, dissemination through press, through, uh, through all this social media. We think we have a, a good uh, reach. We receive, with all these years, as you said, seven, more than 700 applications. And the, and, the, and the selection of it is very difficult because the, uh, there are moments in which it's impossible to compare because people are coming from different walks of life. They were different kind of uh, set of ideas uh, or, or themes that we were uh, asking, and they were very broad. Uh, but the, and the process of the jury was something that we have to invent because we couldn't have one jury because we couldn't put international people coming from Latin America in one place. It was almost impossible. If not, we couldn't have, have the fellowship if we would have done this. And then uh, we designed a special uh, process of evaluation that we designed it with the, with the with a professor in the University of Buenos Aires, an expert on evaluation who unfortunately died, uh, Edith Litwin, and she was the one who was sitting with us and, and, and creating with us this process on three steps. Uh, I only can say that it was a privilege for us who were in, the, uh, in some of the parts of the jury to work on this because it was a way of taking the temperature of which are the issues that there are important uh, in Latin America and then transpire in the applications of the uh, I won't say anything more because if you continue to listen, I can continue, but I will stop. <laughs> um, unfortunately, and due to the changes of time, we cannot count uh, with the representative of the Colombian consulate. Uh, that they apologize very much, but we totally understand. And this is why we value double the, present, the presence of Paulina here. Um, then I will present uh, Patricia. Patricia uh, has a PhD in political science, uh, very recent, from 2017, as well as a master um, in public policy from the Universidad del Externado de Colombia. She's a public officer at the Colombian Ministry of Technology and Information, where she participated in the formulation of a broad-brand infrastructure project. Formerly, she was advisor to the administrative department of the human rights program of the Presidency of the Republic, and she has published several peer-reviewed articles and has taught undergrad courses in different universities in Colombia. I think you have a good, uh, 
very, very brief video. We apologize, we couldn't go more. Uh, and with all the qualifications, uh, and more than needed qualifications for this project. Thank you, and this podium is yours. Well, before to start, I want to express my gratitude to the Observatory on Latin American staff here in the new school. Uh, it has been a wonderful experience, uh, so I want to say thanks. Um, well, as Margaret said, I work for the ICT ministry. So research comes with, an, uh, with a, a warning uh, in terms that uh, researchers uh, must be part away or they have to leave emotions behind in order to analyze facts. And working for a public entity is um, similar somehow because uh, we have to understand that not all kind of problems can be fixed with the resources that we have. But even though uh, those warnings are very away from reality because problems such as inequality or injustice confronts us as human beings. And even if we can't come out with the solution, um, we have to try to expose those problems. Um, so this is what I'm going to talk about, uh, digital exclusion in Colombia. So just to introduce the context of rurality, um, let's say that the population is about um, 48 million, uh, but the density is quite a problem, uh, 42 people per square kilometer. Uh, Colombia is a middle-income country and is the third most unequal country from South America behind Brazil and Bolivia. The rural population in Colombia is a 20, is a almost 20%, but if you compare the size of that population, it's bigger than Uruguay, Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Finland, Paraguay, Israel, Honduras, Austria, Sweden, and the whole country of Bolivia. So it's a lot of people who is living in conditions that you're going to see. And 40% of that population actually is dispersed on the territory. Some indicators of the rural people um, is briefly shown in here, like poverty, the monthly income per person is just $91. 6% of the population lacks the totality of public services. 7% were excluded from social security in 2015. 37% were informal workers. Analphabetism is reaching almost 13% over 15 years old people. And actually, the National Planning Department has found a correlation, a positive correlation between social gaps and armed conflict. As you can see, the most uh, municipalities where the where the conflict has been the highest, uh, they, they lacked different kind of services and they have tremendous social gaps. Actually, geography poses a substantial challenges to infrastructure expansion uh, because of the technical complexity, so many mountains and geographic accidents, uh, and of course, there are high transportation costs to bring infrastructure and develop different kind of public services. So if you compare population density uh, explains somehow, you know, partially uh, why the internet penetration rate is too slow in those regions, which you can see the match uh, by the colors, same as mobile coverage. So talking about digital exclusion, uh, in 2015, um, we, could, we could describe it by internet access in households. And since 
43% of urban, urban households had internet. Only 4% in rural towns um, were available for those families. Uh, the penetration of terminals, computers, 50% in rural areas and only 11% in rural towns. Less than 30% of public schools were connected in 2015. 30% of rural towns lacked internet public access. And the monthly household's income for communication services in rural town only reached five cents. But there is a qualitative dimension as well. And when you compare the distribution of the telecenters according to the available rurality index in Colombia, you will see that you might think that the allocation of those resources seems fair. If, if you take, for example, the United Nations Development Program Index, um, because you can see that most of the rural towns which have the highest percentage of uh, rurality seem to be covered by public internet access. Same if, if you take, for instance, the National Planning Department uh, Index, but if you compare an alternative index, which is based on uses of land, you will see that the allocation actually is not fair at all. It's, it's the opposite. 95% of those telecenters are located in the lowest rurality um, communities. So um, that might be an indication that the allocation that public offices <coughs> are doing actually is encouraging or inducing um, some inequality or some discrimination in rural towns. So this is the question that I, that my research post is, how can this <coughs> severe expression of digital divide be explained despite the fact that Colombia has a universal service fund which <coughs> invests 40% of its annual budget, which is an amount around $100 million a year in infrastructure projects. So as a theoretical frame, I took the historical institutionalism. And just to, to clarify some notions, um, let's see that um, paradigms and policies are institutions that constrain the set of alternatives apply applicable in the solution of problems. Time, space, and sequences influence the development of important process and the policy changes has an historical <coughs> character. As a methodology, I picked process tracing, which is a causal inference where sequence of predictions and validations come for every assumption of the hypothesis of the research. So the hypothesis is that the reinforcement of the internet access gap in rural towns between the last two decades is a consequence of a path-dependent process. This is a very simple concept. That means that the sequence of the decisions made in the past actually have come to an inefficient result or outcome. So what I did was to recreate the universal access policy along the two past decades and trying to validate each of the steps of that construction. So we'll see that there was a critical juncture before the policy was designed, that there were, uh, were alternative courses of action uh, when the design was made, and that along the implementation of that policy, there was a reinforcement mechanism that has created the digital divide in rural towns, or in some way, it has created a, um, a, a phenomenon of exclusion for those communities. So right now, there is a locked-in point which makes very difficult to reverse that path that has been implemented. So to start, the critical junture shows you that in the first years of 
of the 90s. Colombia, as many other countries in the region, um, introduced a new free market paradigm. And the telecommunication sector actually was reinvented. Uh, the efficiency criteria, the competition, and the market expansion were the goals of the new policies for the telecommunication sector. So for non-market areas, where the former public operator um, that was dismantling, it would be a universal service fund to provide the service. So the universal service takes the, the resources from the sector and invested in different projects for the areas that can't meet the requirements for private investment. So those resources will be allocated through periodic public tenders. And the legislation in Colombia for those tenders are very demanding. So experience, for instance, is one of the main, the main criteria that um, are taken into account to allocate the resources. So I will explain it later. Uh, but it's important for you to know that the legislation actually constrains uh, the public contracting activity in a very certain way. So in the, new in the new business model, the telecommunication operators will keep the infrastructure ownership for their own to exploit it commercially. And they provide the service for the years that every contract established. But even when Colombia and the many other countries of the region had to, to adjust the state model intervention uh, at that time, alternative courses of action were plausible. If you compare, in 2000, um, the Inter-American Communication Commission released uh, a study about the universal services funds or initiatives that were available in Latin America. And it's clear that some countries chose public operators to provide services, while others chose private ones. Uh, some countries, uh, for instance, uh, took resources from the sector, while others decided to finance those initiatives through public budget. Some other countries decided to manage the universal funds through the regulatory entity, while others did it through political ones. And some others chose to uh, to put in functioning uh, public agencies uh, to handle those or to manage those resources. So even today, countries like Chile, even when they have privatized uh, the main operators in the te telecommunication sectors, uh, they decide to to address this, you know, this need to develop the sector through public budget. And the results they have, you know, um, got in those years, uh, they're very successful. So talking about the um, path-dependent process, I must say that the implementation of the universal access policy embraces a cell reinforcement mechanism that has created a technological bias. So the universal access projects from the beginning were captured by satellite operators because they have so many um, technical advantages uh, in terms of um, providing the service very quickly, making installations which are not complex at all, uh, they can operate that technology um, with alternative power sources. So they don't depend on the availability of interconnection networks. Um, and on the other hand, the experience they have acquired after implementing one project uh, increases their chances to bid in other vendors in the following public tenders. So the technological bias goes on. As a result, the universal access policy in terms of coverage, quality, and affordability, the digital divide in rural towns has worsened. 
If you see the coverage effects of the universal access policy, uh, since 2003, it started to provide the service to, um, in, in rural towns because uh, before that, the policy was focused on urban areas. So recent improvements of the internet penetration rate in urban areas where the, this penetration has been possible uh, thanks to uh, the development of mobile and fixed networks. Um, they ha I I pen I penetration has allowed to the fund to create the resources uh, that they need to allocate it for uh, rural towns. So even so, the average duration of the universal access projects has been 36 months. It means that the service that are provided to the telecenters in rural towns are not constant. They stop and they disconnect those towns every 36 months. So people actually can't uh, develop or can't um, adopt the technology as the way it should be. So the distribution of the internet public access in 2015, as you can see, shows that every department or every state um, in Colombia has public um, access, uh, but in those conditions. In terms of quality, uh, there are a lot that has to be said. Um, the low quality of the internet provided through the satellite technology uh, has restricted its use to emails, phone calls, and downloads of low content files while, um, while interactive applications exceed the capacity of those connections. In terms of the regulation that is current right now, uh, we can see how it induced inequality because the current regulation accepts half of the minimum speed required for satellite providers under market conditions. So it, it, it works in even downstream way or the upstream way. Um, the current regulation accepts half of that speed for the social projects that the fund implements. The affordability effect um, can be shown through, through the uh, behavior that uh, has had the, um, the tariffs that are charged in the telecenters. So if you compare the purchase capacity of those rural households uh, with those tariffs, you can see that the people in rural communities only have increased the capacity to accept the, um, or to make use of that service from 3.1 hours in 2003 to only 10.7 hours in 2015. So it's actually a huge gap in terms of usage or usability of the service. So some concluding remarks um, briefly can show that faith in the market beyond economic rationality leads to an effective and unsustainable intervention. Because the misleading expectations to develop market uh, in regions that can meet the basic expectations of profit um, actually has been turned into uh, a waste of public resources. Second, uh, we must say that technology is neutral in, in its social or political effects. There is a redistributive policy behind the choices that are made when it comes to technology and the kind of services we provide. And third, technological diffusion depends on institutional design. It's not something that behaves spontaneously. So next steps to be made uh, could consider a better understanding about rurality, which is something that we need in order to improve public policies in Colombia. Uh, as, as I showed before, uh, rurality remains like a bl black box. Uh, we need 
we need a better understanding of those conditions and uh, to clarify the concept of rurality, uh, the lifestyle they have there, the activities that they depend on in, in order to, to provide better services or with the quality that those people need. And second, the new models based on social interactions could be explored to develop alternatives on internet access in rural towns. Uh, I've seen in those two weeks uh, different initiatives that are uh, bottom up. And in Colombia, this is something very weird because usually, or might be a cultural thing of us, um, but people is always waiting for the government to come and to solve those problems. Uh, I need that uh, perhaps we need to work a lot uh, to find solutions that come from the basis of the communities. Um, you know, that's something very interesting that I have learned in, in, this year, in those um, days. So thank you so much. take a chance to ask one question, then we'll move to the next speaker. So um, I'm interested in what got you interested in pursuing this line of research. You're working in the municipality and in the government um, uh, technology office, and you, um, you recognize a problem. What got you interested, and, um, and what sparked your insight into this concept of um, path dependency? So you can use the mic, because we're recording. That'd be great. Thank you. Oh, well. Yeah, after six years of, of working uh, to solve some problems for rural communities, and after seeing how many efforts we have made and how many resources we have invested in those kind of services, um, the quality of the services, you know, is, is very bad, and people actually don't um, don't find any any hope. Because even when the service is there, the, per the service is not continuous. Uh, the, the speeds provided are not enough. Uh, we provide services of one megabit per second today, and it started at four kilobits per second 10 years ago. So things actually are very unfair for, for those communities. And, and it's not because the government doesn't do anything, because we do, and, and we, I mean, we take it seriously. Uh, but you know, w we waste so much resources. And then, well, I needed to explain how we came there. So yeah. I, well, that's the first interest um, that pushed me into, into this research. And then, um, as I was going to start my PhD degree, then I, I, well, I said I had very clear what the problem is, so let's find out which is the best way to solve it. <laughs> um, so I was very um, interested in um, how the decisions were made in the past, because sometimes you just forget about the beginning of everything, the outset of those designs, of those policies. And then um, I thought that no one was seeing very clearly that those policies came from a moment when the telecommunication services um, were designed to provide uh, phone lines. And internet came out later and it has so many differences and it poses many challenges. Then uh, the regulation didn't adjust as the way it should have done before. So then was when I understand that you know some possible explanation could be uh, addressed to the um, historical institutionalism and, and this concept of path dependence. Just just to take a moment and you know um, see the whole story. And so I said, let's you know let's come back and see what decisions we have made to, to explain how we came here because. We have been spending so much money, and anything gets better. Um. Excellent. Thank you. So we're going to move to our second speaker, but I'll, I'll give you a, a heads up that in the next part, after the next speaker, when we discuss together, I'm going to ask you what some of the solutions are. So I'll give you some time to think about that um, as we hear from our next speaker. Buenas tardes a todos. 
It is my pleasure to be here with you. I'm going to read it because it's very difficult, your, like, your CV. It is a pleasure to be here with you. I would like to take a moment to thank the New School for having me today. I would like to especially thank the director of the Observatory of Latin America, Margarita Goodman, Michael Cohen from the Observatory as well, and the executive dean of the Schools of Public Engagement, Mary Watson. Thank you very much. I'm also very proud to be here with the present Nestor Kirchner Fellows, Patricia Martinez and Cassandra Castorena. I also want to recognize the Universidad de San Martin and the New School Observatory of Latin America for this initiative that encouraged the intellectual and personal formation of Latin American leaders, but the most importantly encourages the exchange of ideas and talent in our hemisphere. The President Nestor Kirchner Fellowship is an example of the importance and power of that exchange. This is the third time that a Mexican has won this fellowship, and it, it is with great pride that I stand here this evening introducing Cassandra Castorena an incredible thinker, academic, public servant, and now a President Nestor Kirchner Fellow. Cassandra has spent most of her career exploring the, the exchange of ideas and on perspectives through her study of international relations. She holds both a bachelor's and a master's in international relations from the UNAM, one of the most renowned universities in Latin America. She also taught at the International Relations Centers of the School of Political and Social Science at UNAM where she was also a member of a research team led by Dr. Jose Luis Orozco, a specialist in North American studies. Through this role, Cassandra contributes to the strengthening of U.S.-Mexico relations. On top of her role as a researcher, she also participates as a coordinator of academic activities and publications that allow her to be the main liaison with international collaborators residing in Argentina, Chile, Cuba, Colombia, and Brazil. While balancing her responsibilities at the international relations centers, Cassandra has also been a senior program officer in the Mexico City office of the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs. The National Democratic Institute of International Affairs is a U.S. non-governmental organization which counts with offices in 65 countries whose mission is to promote and strengthen democratic institutions and practices through citizen participation, freedom of expression, and collaboration between government and civil society. Through these organizations, she, had, she has worked with notable agencies such as USAID and the National Endowment for Democracy to implement programs that aim to reduce crime and violence at a community level. Although these roles are different, they illustrate Cassandra's commitment and dedication to having exchanges with people across borders, across languages, and across cultures. But perhaps, most importantly, they illustrate her ability and desire to bridge divided to unite, to unite people. Just like the present Nestor Kirchner Fellowship that promotes the exchange of ideas and talent to tackle complex global issues. We are living in a challenging time. The anti-Hispanic and anti-Mexican rhetoric that has dominated the political scenario is not only worrying, but extremely unwarranted. It undervalues the cultural, academic, economic, and societal accomplishments of our people. Mexico is proud of the hardworking Mexicans and Mexican Americans, and any attempt to diminish their accomplishment is an injustice to our community. Nonetheless, there are people who rise up to the, to the occasion, who refuses to accept the status quo, and who use their creativity and intellect to design programs and policies to confront the most pressing issues of our days. And I am proud to say that Cassandra Castorena is one of those people. From working to improve the US-Mexico relationship to working to increase collaboration between Latin America's government and civil society to address security issues, Cassandra's work illustrates her desire and commitment to leading us into a world where everyone can be part of a community, be it local or be it global. So, I have a quote for Cesar Chavez, and he once said, we cannot seek achievement for ourselves and forget about progress and prosperity for our community. Our ambitions must be broad enough to include the aspirations and needs of others for their sake and for our own. When I think of these words, I think of the power that we all have as individuals as thinkers, as dreamers. Chavez World reminds us the importance of being leaders and, a, and of working together to address common challenges. In many ways, he puts into words the work of the recipients of the Nestor Kirchner Fellowship, and it fills me with great pride to yield the stage to one of these leaders, Cassandra Castorena. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Pauline Strasburger, for these extraordinary and introductory words. Uh, thank you, and please thank the Council of New York, uh, of Mexico in New York, for 
uh, for this for these words. I want to also thank uh, Margarita, Mike, and Clara, and other people here in the room, and especially the new school and Ola for this opportunity of having me here sharing part of my work that is not only academic but also part of the uh, professional and experience work that I have uh, built in the last two years. Um, as you can see, the title uh, it's Co-Responsibility as a Security Paradigm in Mexico. And uh, most of the highlights that I will share with you here uh, are based on the practical and professional experience I have had in the last year working with this NGO, National Democratic Institute, but also are part of the critical reflection uh, that I have made uh, based on uh, the master's uh, studies I, I did. Well, in order to start, I want, I want you to read this. Peace is an artisanal product. It is crafted day by day with people's work. This is a quote that I really wanted to use in order to start my presentation because when I listen to the quote, I, I wonder myself, like, that's right. Peace is not something that is industrial. It's not something I can buy. It's not something that you can find anywhere or everywhere. So it's something that needs to be crafted by people. And it's going to mean different things uh, based on the, I mean, depending on the country, your context, your history. So in the end, everybody wants peace, but nobody knows how to find that kind of peace, right? So in order to start analyzing or understanding how can we uh, get that peace in order to have, uh, uh, in, in order to be in a peaceful, in peace with other people in, that is around us. Uh, well, I decided that one way to understand how can this, uh, this peace can be uh, crafted, one way was to study uh, violence. And if we study violence, then we are going to study also insecurity and the unsafety that we have uh, around us. So this is one model that I uh, wanted to use that it's from Johann Galtung, actually very old, from 1969. But I consider it's extremely, um, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, we continue, we, we can continue using this model. So what I want you to observe in this triangle is that we have a, actually one basic uh, classification or one way, one simple way to understand or to analyze violence. So this violence could be uh, divided into that direct or indirect violence. And usually the physical violence, that one that we see every day, it's on the top of the pyramid. So as you can see, but also we have other types of violence that uh, we usually neglect, like the cultural violence or institutional violence, symbolic violence, uh, that it's there, but as it is uh, hard to address this ki kind of violence, most of the times uh, we ignore that type of violence or we prefer not to work with them because of course the kind of results that we are going to have addressing this kind of violence are going to be visible in the long term and rather than in the short, uh, short term. So as you can see, this uh, pyramid, I guess, is really um, useful in order to understand that we have these different connections and these different ways to see and to analyze uh, violence. And at the same time, if I want to study one type of violence, because we must say there are many types of violence, not only one, the, the one that we usually see on the news, on TV, on the press. So uh, there is also different, there are also different types of impacts. So these impacts as well are direct impacts that these are the most common, uh, these kind of impacts are measured uh, more frequently rather than the indirect and invisible impacts, which are usually more damaging than the direct because they, they have consequences or impacts in the long term. 
So I want you to keep this triangle or this model in mind because uh, as you can see, uh, I started my presentation, presentation telling you that I was interested in understanding how can we find peaceful places, peaceful communities, how can we find or craft that peace, then uh, I think one way is to understand how that peace is, is, be, is being uh, affected by the violence and insecurity that we have in our context. And therefore, I consider that, well, uh, it's necessary to reframe or to redesign or to think differently the way we are analyzing the security and uh, safety paradigms and policies that we have in our country, especially in the Latin American countries. I must say that maybe this is not only a problem in Mexico, but most of, it, I mean, it's a global problem. Violence is not only a problem in Mexico. But uh, what I find interesting is that in Mexico, we are starting to introduce a different way to uh, address the violence and the causes of violence. So here you have, uh, I, I, I argue that the security policy paradigm requires the inclusion of an active citizen participation uh, and human rights approach. I say active citizen participation because sometimes uh, governments in general say that they are including people because they consult people. But sometimes they consult just by, uh, I don't know, maybe with a survey, or maybe making a very brief or short meeting at the local level, but it's just one way. I mean, the participation of the citizen, it's like a passive participation, and I am arguing that it's necessary to change that kind of participation for an active one. And what it means to be active in this kind of uh, part citizen participation? Well, you need to consider that, first of all, the citizen is the person who is uh, who has the knowledge of what happens at the local level, right? So either if it's in a neighborhood, neighborhood a, a community, uh, I mean, it's the citizen who has the knowledge. Therefore, he's the first prime, or it's the primary source we should, we should consider in order to design bottom of interventions. And this is one of the principal uh, characteristics of the of this uh, other paradigm, because usually the security and safety agendas are designed uh, up and bottom. And from the federal and uh, national level, usually only the institutional or the gover governmental level, and sometimes they just send the instructions or direct directions to the local uh, government, gov government offices in order to implement the, the interven interventions, but the proposal is to go the other way around. So you need to go to the community, you need to start talking and to the citizens that live or that are residents there and ask them like, what's the problem? What has been, what has changed? What do you consider needs to be like the solution? So you need to start designing and only, I'm talking only about the designing of the security strategies. Other moment will be the implementation, another will be the, the evaluation. But in this moment also, we are talking about only the design. So if you include the citizen in this design process, then you will uh, start making the citizen uh, an agent of change, of the local change because uh, you are considering the proposals of the citizens and you are considering the needs of the citizen. So this citizen is becoming an agent. So it has some more active role in this uh, security or safety design. So uh, the idea is that if you involve or include more the citizen, then it will be in a way responsible also of the strategies and the actions that are going to be taken at the local level. So that's what we are asking for, to include the citizen, citizen, citizen as a responsible uh, actor in the security or sa safety agenda. Not only a person who receives the protection of the security model, but also someone who implements the security and safety uh, actions. 
So based on this, well, uh, you must say, like, well, violence has um, a long history <laughs> in our country. Of course, it's not something new. But as you can see in the graph, uh, certainly the indica indicators show us that the violence has increased in the last 10 or 15 years in Mexico. Now, one of the first questions is why? So here I have you this number that is a, the standard or national indicator that tells us the number of homicides that are registered every, every year. And I am taking this number out of the national statistics, national and official statistics in Mexico that of course should be considered because they are telling us like the situation or the risk situation in the country. But this is not the only indicator that we should take into consideration because uh, for instance, in terms of methodology, we need to analyze like, well, these kind of homicides are committed by, by why, what kind of violence? I mean, it, it was it, what, with guns, with no guns, was because of the operations of the organized crime in Mexico, or it was because of other type of violence. I mean, to know the number is not enough, so I need to disaggregate this number in a, into qualitative uh, data in order to understand objectively what's happening with the situation of violence in Mexico. But uh, in, the end, in the end, what I rescue is that um, we need to observe these numbers. Also, we have these other numbers that tell us about other types of violence, right? Like, for example, uh, in this case, talking about only 2017, more than 50% of the people in Mexico uh, suffer one type of violence. I mean, half of the population has been under the context of violence. And you can see the percentages of other types of violence, but we have, I mean, at home, uh, at school, at work, uh, look at the numbers of sexual violence, and I am not telling you how many of these are is happening with kids in Mexico. I mean, it's really, uh, it's a really huge number. But um, what I try to say is that if you look at the map, I mean, the darker, the more violent, right? So all of the map, it's covered by violence, these other types of violence. So uh, that is in the case of objective data indi or indicators, but here you have other kind of indicator that is the perception of the insecurity of the people in the country, which is also important because uh, it's not only what I mean, the statistics says, but also how the people feel with the insecurity in, in, the, in their communities. So here I just have these three indicators that, for example, uh, in the survey they ask like, what was the issue that need to be addressed primarily by the government and out of 32 states, 29 answered that must be insecurity. Uh, the second priority was health and the third priority was increase of prices. So as you can see, also the citizen has something to, to say about the model of security in Mexico. So uh, of course, here what we need to be careful about is that the perception of the insecurity is not going to be the same for a citizen in rural places than for a citizen in a urban place, or a citizen in the north of the country or in the south of the country. Or if I ask a woman who has had the opportunity to go to the university and study and be, in, be informed, that if I ask a woman from an indigenous group that actually does not speak Spanish, but that is suffering violence at, uh, at home. I mean, so it depends on who we ask and how we ask, of course, the kind of perception that we are going to register, right? But at the end, it's a general situation. So other way to start including uh, the citizen in this kind of uh, 
new paradigm of security, it's like uh, if I ask citizens and if they participate in the process of design, they will help me to understand the nature of the threat because it's not everything that is linked with violence uh, is related to the organized crime. And I think this is something we need to understand. Uh, during this two weeks that I have been here, a person told me, like, well, in Mexico, you are experts in, in violence, right? And I say, well, we are not experts, but we know more, uh, we, we know a lot about violence. And what, what we need to understand better is like, uh, what kind of violence is affecting, in what level, at what kind of population, at what age, what are the negative impacts? What are the post the strategies that are uh, helping to minimize the, the these threats? Uh, I mean, now these uh, threats are not only national or domestic, but also transnational. So they require a new, uh, a different um, way to address these kind of threats. But at the same time something that we have to observe, it's like <coughs> what is the profile of the victims that have been affected by these different types of violence. And I mentioned before, it could, we have kids, we have women, we have elderly people, we have uh, people uh, actually uh, with uh, disability. Uh, I mean, we have different populations that right now are being victims of violence. and. All of them need a different uh, kind of solution. But at the same time, we need to ask ourselves about the profile of the aggressors, these people that actually commit the violence, because most of the times the programs and interventions are uh, designed to work with the victims, but not with the aggressors. And if we do not work with the aggressors, then these people will continue uh, uh, committing this acts of violence or crime. So we need to work with both uh, actors. And finally, well, we have the, to understand the local context. So uh, something that I have learned uh, in the last years when you study the security agenda and that I confirm here through the different interviews is that usually the security agenda, it's just a political tool that some actors use in order to promote some interest. And I say actors because it's not only government who has political interest. We have other actors from private sector, from the organized crime, who actually has also a political interest. And sometimes the security agenda is the best uh, means to, to, to set this uh, interest in the public agenda. But that's usually what, that is usually what happens at federal and or national level. It's completely different when you are working at a local level where you have more opportunity uh, to actually promote other strategies in order to address the security or violence problems. So I think what I'm trying to say in this case is like, yes, it is a political tool, tool I agree, but we need to take the, the advantage of the local level, that it's, uh, it's a completely different political scenario, right? So, well, based on this uh, context and in the evolution of these threats and the profile and the local context, I think it's necessary to start uh, thinking of a complementary or mixed paradigm or model. So. I need to continue working with the traditional security model, but also I need to include the model uh, that is uh, being promoted through the citizenship security. I want to say that I consider both of them are complementary, complementary to each other, so we don't need to work, I mean, we don't need to substitute one for the other, but both at the same time. Of course, each of them has special characteristics, but what I want to emphasize is that in the citizenship security model, of course, the person or the citizen is at the center of the protection or at the center of that uh, paradigm. 
and in the traditional security, well, we observe more the state as an institution, right? Both of them are necessary, but the citizenship security has a human development or a human rights approach that actually consider other kinds of indicators that we mentioned before, like the problems with employment, education, poverty, inequality, that of course are not going to be solved with this uh, single agenda, but at least it's, it's sensible to those kind of indicators and that's what we need to start working on. And for example, uh, in the citizenship security, uh, the emphasis is in the causes of the violence rather than in the effects of the violence. So if you want to start uh, eradicating the problem of violence, then start working on the causes of the, th that kind of violence, right? And finally, well, uh, I think the citizenship security, it's an opportunity since it includes more the participation of the people. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, this will give us a more inputs of what to do, how to do it, and how to personalize the programs according to the local uh, context. Well, so just to finish, don't forget to take into consideration this model of the violence, the structural and symbolic and cultural violence that it will ter take more time to be addressed and, I don't know, if eradicated, but uh, you need to start working on that. And you need to include both models of security in the both levels of the pyramid. So I, I think part of the co-responsibility model of uh, needs to include both uh, analysis, if the violence analysis and the security uh, model analysis. Um, so my final remarks, uh, as I mentioned before, we need to start identifying and the causes of the violence, but also recognize that it's a a problem because sometimes you, ident you identify the problem or the cause, but actually you don't recognize and you don't make it visible. So it's not possible to uh, to set up to set this problem into a public agenda and to have budget in order to work with this kind of violence. So we need to start making a work of strategic communication in order to make other actors understand why working with the causes of violence actually will have more benefits in the long term that rather than just concentrating on the effects of that violence. So we need to start considering uh, the inclusion of other indicators more related with the human development approach. And uh, of course, uh, it's necessary to consider the citizens insight and particip participation in the whole cycle of the public policy, not only the design, but also the implementation and evaluation and monitoring, because they are not only the benefits, I mean, the citizens are not the only the benefit, the benefit, the ones who are going to benefit from the model, but also they are going to be the owners in the future of this kind of model. So they need to participate, participate in the whole cycle. So just to finish, I just think that we need to ask ourselves what are we doing in our communities, in our home, in our office, our work, in order to be part of the solution and in order to be responsible of contributing or promoting this kind of uh, model that actually is addressing the violence issues in our context. Thank you very much. So I know Patricia, you're on a tight timeline, so I'm going to I'm going to give you a chance to ask the first question if you'd like to ask a question.
All right, so thank you very much. That was, that was really fascinating. Um, so Cassandra, um, my first question for you is really about in what way in developing this model have you talked to citizens about how they'd like to participate or what are your ideas about getting citizens' voices in the development of the model that you're presenting? Well, actually, I have found that we need to go one step behind. Before including the citizen, we need to inform the citizen about this model because uh, most of the people uh, normalize violence because as we have always lived under a violent context, most of the times the citizen actually doesn't identify that it's living under a violent uh, context. So first of all, we need, uh, it's, we need to start with education, right? So we need to create programs in order to inform and educate people, the citizens, that what the different types of violence, as I mentioned, and later we need to inform the citizens that there are different participatory uh, mechanisms they can actually use in order to be part of the public, uh, just the public solutions, right? Like not only uh, in meetings with their local government officials, but also like making consultations, uh, Fox groups, uh, workshops, I mean, we have different methods in order to involve the citizen into the, this new model. But I, I must say, first of all, we need to help them be aware of these different types of violence and the different types of solutions. Yes. So um, I, I had an insight listening to both of these papers and trying to put together what the two of you were saying. And I was really um, intrigued um, by um, your question about path dependence because it made me wonder, um, and this is a question for each of you, um, what effects do you think generational change have on the addressing of uh, both of the problems that you're looking at? Because if you think about this notion of path dependence, which I thought was a very helpful construct, it basically says that you're in a moment in time with a certain group of people who establish a particular solution under those conditions. And what you were saying is then the conditions change, but these individuals, people perhaps like myself, who have been on this path-dependent model for some, uh, some period of time, um, uh, come up with solutions that actually fit a problem that doesn't exist in the same way anymore. Um, and so I wonder if you think about the issue of uh, violence uh, in the US, just as I was thinking about Florida as you were talking, what we've seen in breaking that path-dependence is this next generation of young people who have come forward now to say, we're gonna come up with different community-based solutions. We don't trust in the, the paradigms that have been put forward by our, um, our path-dependent elders because we find that there are no solutions um, embedded there. So I wonder, um, to what extent do you think that the role of generational change or younger people is actually part of the solution to the problem that you're working on? I'll ask each of you that. Well, it's, it's very, very clear in the telecommunications sector that those changes um, have been um, joined by a generational, generational change too. So, uh, talking about digital divide, uh, for instance, um, um, means that um, perhaps the need is, is more sensitive now than it was before because new generations actually depend on technology for doing everything, you know, to get education, uh, to look for a job, uh, to get information, to, to entertain, actually, because entertainment comes through line uh, most of the time. So new generations um, identify this problem more easily. And it's, um, and they're, you know, somehow they're committed to uh, to use and to get involved with technology in a, in a more definitely way than older <coughs> people used to. So perhaps this is one of the, uh, of the forces 
that are behind the path dependence way to uh, to reverse, mm -hmm. you know, the, the phenomenon. Uh, but on the other hand, genera uh, generations change is also um, getting a little bit complicated the the solution because um, young people actually uh, don't want to live more in rural towns. You know, the, the lot of people that are um, coming to the cities to find new opportunities, uh, new lifestyles. So it's a little bit complicated because uh, even when the technology is a need for young people in rural towns, they're trying to, to escape from the reality. So uh, we have been uh, urbanizing, uh, if, if that word even exists. <laughs> Yeah, okay, um, yeah, so um, it's part of the solution, but as well is a challenge there that reminds. So, um, so perhaps if, if I was um, like describing before, if we can try to figure out how to, to encourage people to come and work together, perhaps young people might be, you know, like the key in order to, to find this way. That, that's very good that they have to actually see it as their problem as opposed to what you're saying, which is to escape the problem and go to the urban area so that they don't have to attend to it. Um, Marga mentioned earlier the, the Cuba studio, and I'm reminded, looking at Oscar, who's one of our uh, recent graduates, um, and his experience in, uh, in, in Cuba when I visited them, I guess it was the summer before last, and the absence of technology access was a real stressor for the student group who were um, in, in Cuba, and that's where I learned about the paqueta and the ability to get, you know, social media and other kinds of products, you know, on a on a small digital um, um, a disc as a way of um, addressing the problems that you still have access to media because it's really an essential part of, of their life. So, what do you think about generational change? Well. I think it's an opportunity. Actually, uh, I'm glad you asked about jo young people because actually they are the most committed population we have found in order to uh, start developing an, a different paradigm. And also it is important to point out the participation of young people because most of the times they are only uh, included in, you know, into a criminal agenda. like. If you think of violence, if you have the equation of violence and young people, you have a, a, crim, a crime. I mean, it's a criminal agenda, either of young people that are actually in prison or that will go to prison sooner because of their context, but most of the studies or the work or programs that uh, have been designed for young, for the youth, uh, are linked to the criminal agenda. and. Fortunately, in Mexico, we have had, uh, I mean, we have identified that actually these young people, and when I say young people, I'm thinking between 15 and, I don't know, 29, 31 uh, years old, they are actually the most active, they are more creative, and they actually have other ways to use technology and to use uh, other resources in order to involve people to design other kind of programs, to design uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, instruments. So young people are the ones that are actually uh, less, um, they, do, they, don't, they don't have this political, let's say, I mean, it's, it's a way to say it, but they don't have this political loyalty that need to follow, so they are creating their own agenda. So. Actually, it's easier for me uh, since the, from the NGO that I work on, it's easier and more effective to work with these young generations rather than with other people because I find more resistance. I mean, it's possible, but it will take more time to make the people understand that there are other ways to, to, to solve the problems, right? So I would say that about the job. So I have a, thank you, Cassandra, I have a follow-up question. Um, so you work in an NGO, um, and we heard about an NGO experience and a, a government experience. How do you think these different NGO and government and private sector actors are playing out in this issue of addressing 
violence that you're talking about? First of all, they do not talk the same language. I mean, even though all of them talk about violence, none of them understand violence as, I mean, as a, in the same terms or with the same vocabulary. So it, actually, this is one of the first strategies that we have, be, we have, we started to, to do like join people from the public sector, govern, governmental sector, people from civil society organizations, people from academia, people from, I mean, citizens <coughs> in general, all together in a room and have them discuss what they understand for violence, for insecurity, for peace. I mean, they need to discuss the concepts all together because uh, they have different frameworks. So it, it's, it's really interesting that once they discuss and share their ideas and then they get go back to their places, they are actually starting to include these different insights uh, into their daily work. So it's been really interesting to work with the different actors, uh, the same problem, because actually we need a um, multi-sectoral, it's correct to say, multi-sectoral solutions. We, we cannot offer a strategy that it's only governmental or only from the civil society. We need to work with the different sectors. And what do you think, Patricia, about the NGO's uh, role in the, you know, the access to technology and to the rural access, but also to issues of you know, fair access to speed of technology? How can they be helpful? Well, we have so many NGOs um, trying to promote the closure of digital divide, but most of them are working on the usage gap. So they come with different kind of contents and strategies and training uh, plans for people. Uh, strategies to teach them how to be safe on the net, uh, different kind of approaches, but none is um, willing to to pay for the infrastructure infrastructure building or the um, operation of the networks or the maintenance. Uh, you know, uh, the access gap uh, is um, you know it's very hard to solve. <laughs> but but NGOs uh, and multilateral multilateral agencies are uh, coming together to provide different kind of alternatives for the usage uh, usage gap, which is which is great. So we'll open it up. I'll, um, I'll ask Paulina one more time to take a question now. We'll take it. <laughs> So now we are trying to change the argument like 
It is a human right, of course. The state has the resources, the institutional and financial resources to start doing something about it, but also you are part of that state. And if you are part of the state, then you need to be responsible too. So in the, probably in terms of a narrative, this is how we start. But at the same time, uh, one exam, one resource that we have found useful is the creation of citizen council, maybe. And this citizen council, uh, it's a group of people that is composed not only by civil society organizations, but also by citizens. And they meet once a month or twice a month, it depends uh, on the agreements they do, but they meet with people from government at local level in the security or safety institutions, and they start developing agendas, uh, strategies, and it's a process of consensus building at the same time, but the interesting thing is that we have uh, broken the first barrier that is like have them together. So this is the first, like make them understand that they need to work together. Second, whenever they have uh, they, they have built or created this council, they decide on an agenda in the long term and they need to start developing different mechanisms or instruments in order to make the agenda uh, be implemented, right? It's not only having meetings and discussing points of view because it's not, you know, it's not a seminar. It's part of a working uh, group. So uh, we have found that, for instance, these kind of uh, periodical meetings have helped to uh, analyze the security, uh, local security programs before they are implemented. And in that way, you can have like a pre-evaluation of what actually will work instead of uh, spending the resources and then implement it and then realize that it was wrong. So this is like one of the most uh, useful resources we have found, the creation of these citizen councils at local level. They talk about only uh, these citizenship security issues. Uh, and you have people from the different municipal dependencies and institutions, not only the security. You have people from the public health, people from education. So it has, I mean, you, you happen to listen the points of view of the different uh, uh, people from government. One question to each because yes. uh, for Patricia uh, and the doctor in the parodies, perhaps you do think about this a little bit more. Uh, you are working at the, at the government in the, the ministry. Uh, can you imagine uh, a gap in the <coughs> world in which you can push this agenda uh, about uh, bettering the access in rural communities? to uh, the digital world. And you think that there are some possibilities there? You don't think it. I, I know perhaps I am actually asked this kind of things, but I, I am interested because uh, in every place we work, sometimes there are gaps, there are kind of cracks in the system in which we can advance with so much. So, and, and, and for Cassandra, I was, um, you work on international affairs, mm -hmm. and then can you tell us and tell the public uh, what, uh, why you address this issue uh, of security with these different paradigms, etc., etc.? What took you? You can imagine, but it's good to hear. Okay. Oh, well, just. Well, just to say something about the work, the way we work. Uh, this problem has been identified for so long. I mean, people inside the industry know very well the nature of this problem, uh, you know, the, the importance, uh, the relevance that it has. And even if, if that is very clear, uh, there are certain things that are actually are not common. First of these is that uh, 
people uh, seem to, to understand that the services provided for rural towns, um, even if they're important, are not at the same level of the services provided for urban people. Because people who live in uh, rural towns are, are the less. So uh, they feel somehow obligated to, to solve all their kind of digital gaps problems in cities because it's where people is concentrated. So so it's so unfair, but that's the way they, they perceive. They perceive their duty, um, you know, uh, somehow related in a more intense way or directly uh, with urban problems. Because the gap in urban towns uh, is, is huge. Their affordability gaps. So maybe it is not the same severity of the, in terms of access. Uh, they prefer to think that uh, they are, you know, obligated to solve first the urban needs. And the second problem that we have is that when we change <coughs> our administration, it's exactly to be born again. So everything is again when we change the, the, the administration. So we we try to take the news and, and try to explain all those problems, and then it's like you know the learning curve starts again. So yeah, but just you know for for your knowledge, uh, yeah, we have been had those discussions, and the problem is actually very clear. But when it comes to prioritize the solutions. Well, that's, that's why um, I said at the beginning of the presentation that policies are institutions. I mean, they have such power, and they, you know, they constrain so many things. And inequality is one of those consequences of those institutions. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's been a challenge for me to start working on this kind of topics because, as you mentioned, I come from a background of international relations where the object of study is the state in the international community and the international institutions <coughs> or the Latvian institutions, and everything seems to be very advanced at the international level, right? So we have these uh, interna international standards of human rights, so like, I mean, the programs and all the legislation that we have because of the United Nations and you name it. You can name the institution or the country. I mean, that's what we do in the international relations, right? But uh, when I have the opportunity to join this NGO and to know that actually there there is a possibility to start like taking this international work to the local or micro level, it was a challenge for me to, because it was, it forced me to think differently my object of study, right? So now, instead of thinking from the international to the local level, now uh, I'm doing this the other way around and trying to understand how it works at the local level and what actually it's really, uh, harmonized, you know, with what happened at state, national, and international level. So uh, I, I try to, to mix what I studied uh, and what I do, you know, because sometimes it's completely different. But that's what was the most interesting part of this, that it has been a real work to explain my partners from other NGOs, like, you know, there are other experiences in other countries that have actually worked, and the ones that you are importing are not working, so it's interesting to, to see and discuss like the different practices that are happening in other countries, and there's where my international uh, background appears. But then when I am working with the civil society organizations or a person who has been a victim of violence in the municipality of certain state, I need to forget about this, you know, international background and start understanding the what, what, the context at the local level. But, so this 
has been actually really um, it's like a different career for me I, I must say but it has been really uh, you I have more benefits than negative impacts so just one last question in closing. Um, can you say something about how the Kirshner Fellowship, your trip to New York, how that's been the, what, the last uh, few days or this last week or so, and, and what it's, um, how it might have shifted your frame, or what's happened while you've been here? No, it has been great. Um, I've met different people uh, working from different disciplines. Um, you know, so it's great to learn how different point of views related to the same problem, um, you know, enlarging the possibilities that you have considered before to address it. So um, I learned a lot about uh, initiatives that are taking place here in New York to solve different parts of the gap. Because as I said, you know, the digital divide has so many legs. So um, one is the access, but there are so many. And actually, uh, it's very interesting to see how people who have been exposed to the technology for so long now are finding different different challenges, different gaps are are created and has been created um, like so often. So it's like uh, you know to see the whole picture. I mean, uh, what is coming next to when you can solve the access gap? So it's it's been very interesting and. Um, Taking um, into account the perspectives uh, from people who is actually working in the city hall, uh, what are the challenges here in New York for people who live in so different conditions, different cultures? Uh, but some of the problems are actually are really similar. The concentration of the market, the power of those companies of the telecommunication providers uh, actually are the same. And so the challenges, um, some are different, some are similar, and this is very interesting. I have learned so much during those weeks. I really, I'm very, very um, grateful for this opportunity. Um, and how was your experience been? Uh, of course, there is a lot to say, but I must start with like, this fellowship has um, has <laughs> put in doubt most of the assumptions that I have had. <laughs> so it's working. I don't know if it's that good or bad, <laughs> but that's what happened. So actually, I'm having like these academic uh, dilemmas right now about like how to continue, you know, my research in the PhD because <laughs> through the different interviews that I have had and. I think the best of uh, this uh, agenda is that you have the opportunity to get to know people from other disciplines, and not only from your discipline, which is actually really good because it makes you think the problem in a different way. Like, uh, I mean, there are certain aspects of the violence and insecurity topics that I have never thought of it. And Thanks to these interviews, I had the opportunity to have like a broader uh, view of the problem. And so now I have new doubts. And of course, I have new research interest. Of course, at the end, all of them are going to be always about Mexico. And most of all, are going to be about the US-Mexico relations. That's for sure. But now I have other, I think I have other ways to continue my my my, my research interest, and well, uh, the last point is that it helped me confirm the relevance of uh, addressing these kind of issues from the academic side, but also uh, like promote this intersection or interaction that you mentioned, Marga, of the practice and experience and the academic and research. I mean, if we do not match both components of of the academic and the professional uh, part, I mean, probably uh, we are doing just half of the work, right? So, thank you. All right.
right. Well, thank you both. It's been our pleasure to host you. And let's have a final round of applause uh, for the two speakers.